everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Council Member Rory Lantzman, Chair of the Committee on the Justice System, and welcome to this hearing on the District Attorney's uh, Investigations and Prosecutions of Wage Theft. Wage theft is one of the most destabilizing forces in the lives of New Yorkers, putting housing, food security, education, and health at risk. Wage theft can take the form of non-payment of wages or overtime, underpayment, misclassification, or any number of other tricks to exploit those trying to do an honest day's work for an honest day's pay to support their families and their communities. The overwhelming majority of businesses in this city follow the law. They pay their workers as they are supposed to. But the effect of the bad apples is staggering. A study by the National Employment Law Project estimated that more than 317,000 workers in New York City suffer at least one pay-based labor or employment violation per week, which translates <coughs> into an annual loss of more than a billion dollars for low-wage New Yorkers. 21% of workers were paid less than the minimum wage in their previous work week, and more than half of those were underpaid by more than a dollar per hour. Last fall, this committee examined the civil legal services available to victims of wage theft. The legal, civil, legal service providers in that area are doing tremendous work and deserve more support. But civil statutes have their limits. When cases are particularly egregious or unscrupulous employers refuse to pay or try to hide their assets, it is necessary to bring criminal law enforcement to bear. <coughs> the Wage Theft Initiative <coughs> includes the district attorneys of the five boroughs, as well as Westchester and Nassau counties, along with the Attorney General, the State Department of Labor, the New York City Department of Investigation, and the New York City Controller. As of December, approximately $1.2 million owed to nearly 400 workers had been identified and assessed, with several cases still ongoing, and nearly $700,000 had already been returned to workers. This initiative focuses particularly on the construction industry, where abuses are rampant. Companies can be transitory, and many of the workers are particularly vulnerable because of immigration status or language barriers. It is especially important that this initiative represents a partnership across borough lines. Bad actors cannot be allowed to flee their commitments to their workers just by moving their operations across the river. Today, we look forward to hearing from some of our district attorneys involved in this initiative and legal services organizations and advocates about investigations and prosecutions of wage theft in our city and how we can grow this effort. With that, um, I can swear in the witnesses and, and get started. Can you raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Terrific. Um, why don't we start with Manhattan? You could introduce yourself. and. Good afternoon, Chairman Lansman and members of the Committee of the Justice System. I am Executive Assistant District Attorney Michael Sachs, Chief of the Investigations Division. With me today are two of my colleagues. On my far right is Karen Friedman Ignifilo, who is an Executive Assistant District Attorney uh, and the first assistant in the office. And on my immediate right is Diana Florence, who is the Attorney in Charge of the Construction Fraud Task Force. Can I just interrupt you for a moment? Do you have written testimony that you can share with us or no? Yes. Do and our staffer seems to be out of the um, out of the hall at the moment. But as okay. soon as we do, we will hand that up. So I all right. Thank you. Um, so we are presenting uh, testimony on behalf of the Manhattan District Attorney's Office and Cyrus R. Vance Jr., the District Attorney. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about our investigation and prosecution of wage theft. According to Cornell University's Worker Institute, wage theft in New York accounts for nearly one billion in lost wages uh, each year and affects tens of thousands of workers. That's close to $20 million per week. Conventional wisdom suggests that wage theft solely affects low-income workers who are cheated through sub-minimum wage or unpaid overtime schemes. However, the reality is that the problem is much larger in scope and much more pervasive, especially within the construction industry in New York. 
This is because the very same companies who steal from their workers also routinely falsify their records with respect to workers' compensation insurance policies and state tax returns. Furthermore, these unscrupulous companies often subject the same workers to work sites that are rife with safety violations. By committing wage theft and associated frauds, these companies unfairly lower their costs, making it nearly impossible for law-abiding businesses to compete. And every taxpayer shoulders the effects of wage theft because when the workers are, un, uh, are underinsured, it forces government to step in and incur costs that should have been borne by their employer. Recognizing the vital importance of the role of construction plays in our dynamic city, but also knowing that the industry is susceptible to corruption, District Attorney Vance created the Construction Fraud Task Force in August of 2015. Through this task force, we collaborate with the city, state, and federal agencies, worker advocacy groups, and academic scholars on a wide range of issues. Following several successful prosecutions related to health and safety in the construction industry, the task force organized the Wage Theft Initiative. As evidenced here today, the Wage Theft Initiative includes collaborations between seven local district attorney's offices, as uh, you noted, Chairman. Since December 2017, this partnership has resulted in 10 criminal cases and accounted for more than $2.5 million in stolen wages affecting over 400 construction workers. Our collective priority is to target unscrupulous employers who cheat and endanger the hardworking men and women of New York City and state. Wage theft is a form of worker exploitation, akin to labor trafficking and other violations of employees' rights. Its perpetrators take advantage of some of our community's most vulnerable populations, including undocumented immigrants and low-income workers. In addition to the Wage Theft Initiative, the Manhattan District Attorney's Office has a robust human trafficking unit whose mission includes prosecuting labor traffickers. Before I turn the microphone over to my colleague, Diana Florence, I'd like to emphasize a point that is very important to the district attorney and our entire office. Many of the victims of wage theft and other workplace abuses are undocumented New Yorkers and are not always empowered to stand up for themselves. So we want to speak directly to them. We are here to protect your safety and your rights, and we encourage you to work with us to achieve justice without fear of being deported. To achieve this goal, District Attorney Vance invested $1.6 million in a new program managed by the New York Committee for Occupational Safety and Health. The program aims to assist the disproportionate number of immigrant workers who become victims of workplace crimes by making it easier for them to document and report unsafe work conditions, wage theft, discrimination, and exploitation. The New York Committee for Occupational Safety and Health will provide victims with referrals and access to, port to support services regardless of immigration status. This program is expected to benefit tens of thousands of workers in the first three years. We hope that the program will be up and running in a few months. I now introduce my colleague, Assistant District Attorney Diana Florence. Diana is the attorney in charge of the Construction Fraud Task Force. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, uh, Chairman and Council members, for inviting us to provide testimony here today. Before I go into detail about our wage theft cases, I want to begin today by telling you the story of a construction worker named Carlos Moncayo because the investigation surrounding his death is what ultimately led to the creation of the Wage Theft Initiative. Carlos Moncayo was born in Cuenca, Ecuador, and came to New York after high school in 2012. On Monday morning, April 6, 2015, Carlos awakened at his sister's home in Corona, Queens, grabbed a quick breakfast, kissed his two-year-old nephew goodbye, and headed to work as a carpenter in the glittering meatpacking district here in Manhattan. Carlos had much to look forward to. His birthday was that upcoming Friday, just four days away, and his mom was coming in just a few months to celebrate along with his extended family. But Carlos never got to celebrate his 23rd birthday. Instead, he died before lunch less than two miles from this chamber. Carlos died an utterly preventable death when 14 feet uh, of trench, of, of a dirt trench, 
collapsed upon him, raining 3,000 pounds of dirt onto his head and crushed him. Making matters not only criminal but tragic, the subcontractor Sky Materials and the general contractor Harco Construction <coughs> had been warned repeatedly that morning by a structural engineer that was on site about the extremely dangerous conditions and that no worker should be working in or around them. The engineer repeated his entreaties to stop the work over the course of two hours until the moment that trench collapsed upon Carlos. But the superintendent and foreman in charge of the project disregarded the engineer's warnings and Carlos paid with his life. Why? Because supervisors and companies that they worked for were more interested in completing the job on budget than protecting their workers. Now, we're proud at the Manhattan District Attorney's Office that we obtained justice for Carlos's family by convicting the supervisors and the companies responsible for his death. But the case did not end there. While examining Sky Materials documents in the course of that homicide investigation, we found suspicious records revealing that the company was not paying proper wages to its workers, as well as providing false information to its workers' compensation insurance carrier. I am proud to say that not only did we obtain justice for Carlos, but we also obtained justice for his co-workers by obtaining guilty pleas from Sky Materials on the wage theft and insurance fraud violations of law. And perhaps most importantly, we obtained full restitution for the workers of over a half million dollars. Sadly, Carlos's case is not unique, nor an isolated incident. As we continue to investigate wage theft, we see time and time again that wage theft and unsafe conditions on workplaces go hand in hand. Among an unscrupulous subset of the construction industry, wage theft and unsafe working conditions have become the norm, not just in New York City, but across the country. Another example of the health and safety wage theft correlation can be found in our recent case against City Metro Corp. Earlier this month, on the eve of the three-year anniversary of Carlos's death, we have secured guilty pleas from City Metro Corp and its principals for orchestrating a scheme to steal tens of thousands of dollars from workers hired to perform construction work in Manhattan. The defendants pleaded guilty to a scheme to defraud in the first degree, and that very same day, in open court, repaid those workers over $95,000 in stolen wages. Like Sky Materials, City Metro had numerous workplace safety violations, including several accidents that were not reported to the authorities as required by law. To be clear, wage theft is not about incompetent business management or just lack building uh, business procedures. We believe it is a deliberate tactic integral to the business model of dishonest corporations whereby they defraud workers of their wages and deprive cities and states of millions and millions of dollars in tax revenues. These businesses exploit the trust that workers have in the system that if they put an honest day's work in, that they will be paid what they're promised. And when they are not paid, the workers believe their employers who tell them, come back later or next week, don't you worry, I will pay you. In the meantime, workers continue to work, hoping their employers will pay them for the following week. And the cycle continues until workers finally get fed up and quit, often leaving behind thousands of dollars in unpaid wages in the pockets of their corrupt employers. Until recently, wage theft as a business model made economic sense because, as the chairman mentioned in his opening remarks, rarely were there consequences, and when there were consequences, they were merely civil. With the wage theft initiative, DA Vance, working alongside prosecutors from around New York State, changed that calculus. Our goal is to make profiting from the, un, the unpaid blood, sweat, and tears of one's workforce too costly to bear. 
and we believe that our efforts have begun to achieve that goal. The cases that we have brought underscore DA Vance's commitment to protecting all workers from employers who fail to address the safety and security of their workers. I am here to affirm that prosecution of wage theft and unsafe conditions will not end with the recent conviction of City Metro. Through the work of the task force, we have started developing a trusting relationship between law enforcement and workers, many of whom are undocumented. We have received numerous phone calls from workers complaining of wage theft, and we are following up with each of these complaints, as well as complaints received by the New York State Department of Labor. Our office maintains a WhatsApp account for the specific purpose of allowing workers to anonymously report wage theft and safety violations and other crimes related to construction. And that includes not only written reports, but photographs, which have proved to be key in our prosecutions. And that WhatsApp number is 646-712-0298. In the coming weeks and months, the Manhattan District Attorney's Construction Fraud Task Force will unveil several other investigations against individuals and companies that both steal from their workers and place their physical well-being at risk. And the task force has uncovered yet another scheme that unscrupulous companies utilize to steal millions of dollars in wages and orchestrate large-scale workers' compensation fraud, or insurance fraud. Based on the discovery of this scheme, the task force plans to spearhead a new collaboration, uh, a new collaborative initiative, if you will, to tackle these problems across city and, state and county lines. In addition to supporting our prosecutions, there are steps that the City Council can take to improve conditions for New York's construction workers. In February of 2017, DA Vance sent a letter to the Council with recommendations aimed at strengthening enforcement of existing health and safety rules with respect to OSHA training. The letter included the following recommendations. One, creating OSHA 10 and OSHA 30 database to help prevent workers from obtaining OSHA train safety training cards as if they had not actually taken the required safety course. We on the task force have seen that there is a rampant black market with these cards, and even going as far as to say companies that, give, that distribute fake cards to their workers. Building a database would help control that and help enforce this, uh, and cur curtail this practice. Two, barring building permits for a period of five years for a company, its subsidiaries, and its successors, determined by common ownership of two companies that have been convicted of a felony related to worker safety. We believe that implementing these recommendations to not only worker safety convictions, but also to wage theft would provide a powerful deterrent to companies who victimize their workers and would go a long way towards destabilizing the wage theft business model currently in place. Thank you. And we're happy to take questions uh, at this time. Thank you. Um, we'll hear from the Staten Island District Attorney's Office and, and then we'll get into questions. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Lantzman and members of the Committee on Justice System. I am Jeffrey Curiali. I am Chief of the Economic Crimes Bureau, and I am honored to be here today on behalf of District Attorney Michael McMahon and the Richmond County District Attorney's Office. I would like to thank you for allowing the District Attorney's Offices an opportunity to discuss the pervasive problem of wage theft in our city, our efforts to curb it, and specifically what my office is doing in Staten Island to investigate and prosecute employers who exploit workers. Earlier this year, with funding and support from the city, DA McMahon created Richmond County DA's Office's first Economic Crimes Bureau to focus solely on investigating and prosecuting all forms of financial crime. This includes the growing problem of wage theft in Richmond County. To better achieve our goal, RCDA participates in the Manhattan DA's Construction Fraud Task Force, which includes a joint statewide wage theft initiative 
that the Manhattan DA's office has just been speaking about. Within this task force, we do work together with the offices uh, throughout the city, the Department of Labor, and other law enforcement partners across the state to root out these crimes and hold bad actors accountable. Staten Island is currently experiencing a building boom with major commercial developments happening throughout the borough. This opens the door for potential abuses, particularly against our growing immigrant population, which can be vulnerable to wage theft on construction sites and other types of financial fraud. We are working diligently to combat and prevent these crimes, and I am proud to say that our investigations have already led to several successful prosecutions. Recently, our office was referred a case of a subcontractor, Construction Directions Group, LLC, against whom there were allegations of not paying wages. <clears throat> the work site was the Lighthouse Point on Staten Island's North Shore. Following an investigation, we determined that $15,676 was not paid to five workers on the site. As a result, the corporation did in fact plead guilty to petty larceny and was required to repay the wages in full at the date of the plea. They also paid a penalty and they also paid an amount of asset forfeiture. In a separate investigation into a construction site at a public school on Staten Island, we arrested a contractor for failing to pay five victims uh, prevailing wages, which totaled $75,000. The defendant in that case, Ali Syed, pled, pleaded guilty to grand larceny in the second degree, which is a felony, and he was required to repay the wages to the victims. While we have made progress against wage theft on Staten Island, the office still faces challenges in pursuing these types of crimes. As I mentioned earlier, our borough's immigrant population has exploded in recent years and often have been a target for wage theft and other types of workplace fraud. Unfortunately, the Richmond County DA's office is the only DA's office in the city that does not have its own dedicated immigrant affairs unit to better address these issues. While DA McMahon has made requests to the city to fund such a unit, those requests have been denied in the past, leaving us without the resources and staff needed to safeguard these vulnerable immigrant populations at this critical point in time. An, an immigrant affairs unit at the Richmond County DA's office would be tasked with investigating crimes that target these communities, uh, liaising with uh, immigrant groups and developing programming to establish trust and communication that helps address each community's unique issues and concerns. Surely these initiatives would help us to build more significant wage theft cases and better protect the rights of workers throughout Staten Island. Still, wage theft continues to be a priority for Richmond County DA's office. Currently, my bureau, the Economic Crimes Bureau, has opened several investigations into potential illegal activity at different job sites, and we are confident that cases will result in prosecutions and ultimately restitution for the victims of these crimes. At the same time, our joint efforts with our partner agencies and the Department of Labor will continue to produce positive results for the people of Staten Island. With these prosecutions, we are sending the message that denying proper wages and benefits is unacceptable and that the Richmond County DA's office remains dedicated to holding unscrupulous employers accountable. We will continue working to prevent employees from being cheated out of an honest day's pay and prosecute those who commit serious prevailing wage or wage theft violations in our borough. Thank you for your time and consideration, District Attorney McMahon and the Richmond County DA's office look forward to continuing to work with all of you and to better serve the people of the city of New York. Great, thanks to, um, thanks to all of you. Let me mention that we've been joined by Council Member Debbie Rose from Staten Island and Council Member Eric Ulrich from Queens. Uh, so let me understand just the, um, the structure of how wage theft uh, potential uh, criminality and wage theft is, is being uh, uh, um, looked at in New York City, first at the, the macro level. So the wage theft initiative, that includes the five DAs, the, the DAs in, in Nassau and Westchester, the AG's office, the Department of Labor? Yes. Yes. Am I missing any, any organization? Or? The, the city controller's office. 
So can someone tell me just how all those moving parts work together and what kind of level of coordination there is or are all eight or nine of those entities just doing their own thing? So they're not doing their own thing. Um, we at the Manhattan DA's office, um, oh, thank you, sorry. Um, they're not doing their own thing. Um, we at the Manhattan DA's Office Construction Fraud Task Force, after the Moncayo trials, uh, we uh, gathered our partners, um, our, our counterparts in the, five, the, the other four boroughs, as well as the surrounding suburbs and the AG's office, to talk about uh, things that we could do to collaborate. Um, and when everyone had a meeting of minds that small cases, a uh, $10,000 wage theft isn't particularly exciting to do, but if we did them all at once, we, would, we could actually get some attention, and, and most important, besides it's nice to get headlines, but really get the attention of the unscrupulous people that were coming and were working in tandem. So we, we agreed on that, and then what happened was we at the task force have a partnership with the Department of Labor and also with many, um, with maybe many community um, groups and, and unions who refer us cases. So working with um, our counterparts, some of whom are here today, um, they re will re refer us cases. Um, a, a company called City Metro is doing work in your borough in, in um, Queens as well as Manhattan, and they're seen to be stealing from their workers. And so that's an example of a case where we brought the case as well as the Queen's DA's office. So there's a, a two for one in that case. Um, so what happened was we all agreed to do this together and we, the Manhattan DA's office construction fraud task force, we organized the referrals. We figured out the jurisdiction because um, that's not always intuitive. It depends on where they're being paid or it could be where they're housed. A lot of companies aren't in Manhattan but a lot of the wage thefts end up happening in Manhattan because the work primarily is done in Manhattan, not only obviously, all the boroughs are um, having a construction boom. So essentially we sort of centralized it through us and then we would have um, pretty regular meetings um, uh, discussing sort of the progress and then ultimately culminating in the takedown, if you will, in, Dece in early December where we all sort of did the cases together and announced them together. Uh, and Chairman, I, I will just add that the Department of Investigations, the mic. Uh, I would just add that the Department of Investigations is uh, also a part of uh, the initiative and uh, as my colleague just said, um, we have to have regular dialogue about the investigations and the complaints are coming into us because so many of these companies work across county lines uh, and, and so it's important that we keep each other notified of what is actually going on so we find who are the appropriate people to step in and, uh, and bring a case and hopefully make a difference. Is Mock J involved at all, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice? Oh, okay. All right, now just each of your own uh, office's structure. So does the construction industry task force still exist? Yes, yeah. very, very much so. And, and how, how, does that in, how does that interplay with the wage theft initiative or that's just the, what you in Manhattan call your, your wage theft prosecution unit? Uh, no, no, it's not a wage theft prosecution unit. So the Construction Fraud Task Force investigates all manners of, of health and safety as well as fraud. Um, and so we we're, our sort of founding partners are DOI, the Department of Investigation, the MTA Office of Inspector General, the Port Authority Inspector General, and the Business Integrity Commission. What we started with that model to do, bring cases collaboratively. Then what happened is after the Moncayo case in 2015, uh, we expanded. We uh, reached out to industry groups such as the BTEA, the ABC, which uh, that's a union group and a non-union group. We're, we're sort of agnostic on, on we, we, we don't care if you're union or non-union. We have a great relationship with the Carpenters, with NICOSH, all of these different groups, and then ultimately expanded to the district attorney's offices um, and other prosecutors. Uh, we also have a, an academic component. We have law professors that help us in terms of thinking about legislation. That letter that I referenced in my testimony, that was when you, uh, you all were considering the safety bills uh, um, 
And we were hoping that you all would, uh, the council, when I say you all, um, include an enforcement piece. And that's what we're sort of hoping that you'll still consider. Because if you, while you, the council cannot create a felony, you can create a filing requirement. And, if, and, every, and the Department of Buildings has an, an office in every single borough. So if a, a corrupt company has to file something with the Department of Buildings, we have a old uh, felony that a false offering a false instrument for filing that immediately gives us teeth, whereas right now we don't necessarily have that. So we're very much uh, in, existing and we're continuing to bring cases. We have legislative ideas. And as I referenced in my testimony, we have another initiative planned, um, which we'll be unveiling in the coming months and year. Do the other, I, I'm, I'm authorized to say that, that the council is, is actively looking at that second recommendation regarding barring companies that have been convicted of a felony. The first one would be great too though. Well that, all I can say about that is we ended up, we did end up passing the construction industry safety regime 1447 so yes. I'd have to see where that what the interplay is is there um, do the other DA's offices participate in the construction fraud task force or well, that's just Manhattan and the other agencies that you mentioned no yes the other DA's offices as 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 Mr. Carrielli just mentioned they're part of our task force so for example all, 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 all four of the other DA's all, other, all four, plus Westchester, plus NASA, and we're hoping to get Suffolk, uh, Suffolk as well. No, no, I, I just want, I don't want to confuse it with the wage theft initiative. Right. So the, so the construction fraud task force, yes. that's got all those, those jurisdictions, and the wage theft initiative also has their jurisdiction. Yes. The wage, so we have a DA's component to the construction fraud task force. The DA's component we came up with the wage theft initiative as part of it, but the pur the purpose is to keep that area going with another with other ah, collaborative so, initiatives. So the wage theft initiative is the DA's component of the construction fraud task force. It was one of it is one of the initiatives that came out of the DA, but not just the DA's because again the carpenters, NICOSH, right. other the community. Uh, group or um, in the referral group, the referral source is from another aspect of our task force. So it's really one task force, and we did an initiative which involved the, the other DAs. All right, so let me a yes. subset that grew out of the task force. Got it. So let me just understand the, the resources and, and the, the um, uh, structure of, of the Staten Island DAs. It's the Economic Crimes Bureau that handles these cases. Yes. And it's a relatively new bureau. Yes. So uh, how big is it? Do you know, uh, I'm sure you know how many ADAs work there, but, but do you know how much money um, it takes the office to run that bureau? So the bureau currently now has uh, a bureau chief, myself, a deputy bureau chief, and four assistant DAs, um, one of which is now serving in the military, so he hasn't been here for uh, a year or so. Um, and we have two paralegals, and a part-time forensic accountant. And we would handle uh, not just, we're not dedicated just to wage theft or construction task force. We handle uh, the asset forfeiture part of the office. We're the asset forfeiture unit, basically. We handle all grand larcenies, credit card fraud, identity fraud, um, any cybersecurity fraud. Uh, we also handle um, construction fatalities. So there's a fatality construction site, we handle those as well. We also handle the wage theft cases. Uh, we handle insurance fraud. So we have so, our bureau is really, um, you know, handles a wide variety of different cases. And and how much? What is the bureau's budget? Do you know that? I'm not, I'm not sure of the, the actual budget of the uh, right. of the bureau. And and Manhattan, the prosecution of wage theft, is that also? just part of your larger economic crimes bureau? Uh, so it's actually part of our rackets bureau, but um, we have, uh, under my umbrella in the investigations division, we have a major economic crimes bureau, we have a rackets bureau. The rackets bureau is focusing primarily on construction, but with regards to wage theft, uh, not only do we do that through the construction industry, but also wage theft as it Im impacts uh, immigrants. So we have an immigrant affairs unit, and then as I mentioned in my testimony, we also have um, a uh, labor trafficking unit out of our um, out of our human trafficking unit. So we have a couple of different units that, that look at the same type of activity depending upon where it falls. 
Okay. So uh, I want to get to my colleagues' questions, and then I'll before I come back for more. But I just want to touch on one last thing: the focus of of your testimony and and the conversation so far has been very much wage theft in the construction industry. However, as you know, wage theft exists outside of the construction industry. Um, and can you, so can you tell me what, uh, what kind of cases you are seeing and bringing that um, involve wage theft outside of the, the, con the construction industry? I, I can answer that. Okay. So um, my bureau also handles what's called the Crimes Against Revenue Program. Say it again? We also have uh, prosecutors assigned to the Crimes Against Revenue Program uh, through New York State. So we have um, unemployment fraud cases that we handle and tax fraud cases, and that relates to your question, which is non-construction industry. So, uh, well, so the unemployment fraud cases would be brought against individuals lying about their eligibility for unemployment insurance, right? right? And we also right. So now we handle with those cases, Department of uh, Labor uh, agents are assigned to those cases. So, through some of that, we also find employers uh, who either own restaurants or other just businesses uh, in general that are subjecting their employees to wage theft. So these are examples of non-construction sites where this is happening. Um, and, and my point is that almost everyone uh, in the industry, I guess, of prosecuting these cases, we kind of overlap with each other. I think as we were trying to allude to earlier, how do we all know each other, how do we meet? And we do have a lot of meetings and a lot of the same uh, agents that are investigating, whether it's from DOI, the Billings Department, Department of Labor, they, they, everyone kind of knows each other, uh, and we work on a lot of cases. So even if we're working on a construction fatality case today, six months from now on a wage theft case, it's, it's the same agents, it's the same prosecutors. And in the, I think the whole point was to share information so each borough knows what the other borough is doing and which bad actors are doing what in each borough. And we, we, that's why it's a, it's a so, pretty good initiative. So at any given time, let's say now, for example, how many open wage theft cases do you have? Not investigations, maybe you don't want to share that, but how many, how many, the people versus XYZ company do you have going on right now? In right Staten now we, we just closed out our last one. So they come every once in a while, uh, every couple of months, um, and then we try to close them out quickly because we, the point okay. is to get the money back from, you know, for the re restitution for the victims. So these cases typically don't, drag on for a very long time. So although we, you know, I don't want to comment on the investigations we have, but as you said, the other case, we don't have any open cases at this time. We've closed them out right. pretty quickly. So Manhattan, can you just tell us about the other kinds of wage theft that you're seeing and, and how many cases you've got going? So the reason that we were talking about construction is because that's, as I mentioned, Carlos Moncayo really focused us on this issue. Of course, restaurants and grocery stores and car washes, these are all normal places where it's pretty much a very a old and, and tragic tale. Those are areas that are ripe for wage theft. And our office has done those cases, but the differences and the reason that we're talking about it in terms of construction is because we've noticed that it is particularly um, severe within that industry. And we wanted to coordinate efforts across uh, county lines. What I can say, and I think um, uh, my colleague from Staten Island uh, could probably agree, is the cases have been done for years in a haphazard or sporadic way. They come in through what we call our ECAB or our, our Early Case Assessment Bureau, which is where police officers or DOI or whomever will bring a case. But there was no coordination and, you know, as we all, the old saying goes, if a tree falls and no one is around to hear, did it make a sound? If no one knows the cases are being done, there's no impact. Our view was with construction, since we saw it, it was so pervasive, we wanted to coordinate efforts and make lots of little cases into one big picture, a mosaic, if you will. Councilmember Debbie Rose. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to um, know uh, from the Richmond County DA's office, apart from the wage theft initiative, how many wage theft cases has the office prosecuted in the last year and in the last five years? In the last year, uh, I would say around five. 
About five? Yeah. Okay. And um, in the last five years, it would be about five I'm each I'm year? I'm not so? sure. I, w I wasn't part of the Bureau. Well, the Bureau's new, so I was in a different Bureau at the time, so I, I wouldn't know the answer. I'm sorry, I didn't I, hear. I said I was in a different Bureau at the oh. time, so I wouldn't know uh, what the answer to that question. And could you tell me what industries these five um, cases sort of originated from? You know, like retail, food, construction? Construction. Construction, all five? Yes. Okay. And um, how did these cases come to you? They come from um, either a tip from, well, what, either one of the workers is, makes the complaint or they um, come in through another agency, whether it's the Manhattan DA's Legal office aid, construction. Maybe? I'm sorry? Legal aid services or? No, I don't know no. of one coming through them. Okay, and I'm sorry. And there's also, there's liaison groups, community groups that we deal with, and they've brought us cases uh, themselves where the, the victim will go to one of those groups and then they'll contact our office. Um, and so you um, stated that you, um, uh, that you, you would like to have an immigration, immigration affairs unit, um, which you would task with these types of um, cases? Yes. Um, is it that your Economic Crimes Bureau um, is not able to handle um, this, the level of cases that you have? Yes, well, when, you, when we say five cases, you have to remember that each case has multiple victims. So it's not your typical case where someone shoplifted from a store and there's one defendant and there's one victim, the store owner or the store manager. Many of these cases can have anywhere up to, you know, whether it's one victim or 20 victims or 50 victims. Um, so, you know, and, and not everyone is willing to come forward and cooperate for various reasons. And, I, and having someone that's in touch with the community and is the same face all of the time, I think the one theme uh, from my colleagues here is that you don't want to have situations where uh, someone is a victim of a crime like this, they may be hesitant to cooperate with law enforcement, but every time they go to the DA's office or the police, there's a different face and a different person who's not familiar with these types of crimes and also the type of issues that the victim uh, may be nervous about in terms of dealing with law enforcement. And if you have one person that's dedicated to that and can answer all of their questions, make them comfortable that they want to can not only cooperate in the beginning but continue to cooperate, whether that's grand jury prep, grand jury presentation testimony, trial prep, trial testimony, to see the case all the way out, to have someone that is knowledgeable of the laws on this one issue and is the same face every single time, I think that would be a much, benef uh, much more beneficial than having someone who's assigned other types of cases, and then, oh, by the way, this case comes in as well, and you have to deal with all of these unique issues with unique victims and a unique employer and a unique crime. That's not your run-of-the-mill criminal prosecution. So all of the um, cases that um, impacted immigrant, uh, some of our immigrant population would be referred then to the immigrant unit and no longer the the um, crimes, uh, economic crimes bureau? Work hand in hand. Um, you know, the economic crimes bureau has some specialties in subpoenaing records and, uh, you know, history of working with the Department of Labor and can assist uh, in that area. Always can always assist. We, we assist almost every bureau in terms of, um, you know, obtaining records, whether they're employment records, financial records, and, and things of that nature. So you would say that um, the fact that we don't have an immigration um, unit um, has impacted the uh, service sort of delivery that that community has gotten? No, in, I think we, we, I mean, we, we're very attentive. We work with, I mean, I've met numerous times myself with the community uh, leaders and, and also with the victims. We just think that it would be, it would be better. It's just a better way of doing things, a more structured, consistent way. And um, in your statement, um, you talked specifically about um, a case at Lighthouse Point and that you were able to recoup uh, $15,676, which um, were um, wage theft 
um, the, the wage theft amount for five carpenters, and um, and that they pleaded to petty, la petty larceny, um, and so they repaid the the wages in full with a penalty. And you said something about asset forfeiture. Yes, yeah, could you when tell we have me what assets were? Um, well, sometimes what happens when we have cases where um, someone uh, commits a crime and they enrich themselves mm -hmm. um, through the asset forfeiture laws, you could actually have them forfeit that money um, that they enrich themselves with. So was the amount recouped more than the 15000 No, it was, it was $1,000. Excuse me? $1,000. 1000 more? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Chair. I'm good. Uh, we've also been joined by council members uh, Andrew Cohen, Cohen from the Bronx and Alan Maisel from Brooklyn. Does anyone have any questions? No? Good. Andy? Yes. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I apologize that I missed the testimony. And if you've addressed my, some of my questions in your testimony, I apologize again. Uh, it doesn't happen often, but I, I do have an occasion when constituents will come to my office and say they've been you know, they were terminated and they didn't get their last check is, 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 is the complaint that I've seen the most. Um, and I wonder like if there's a, if, there, if there's, you know, <laughs> you might be doing justice by punishing the bad guy, but it's very hard I think for these people, for the victim to get, the wages are gone. Um, I don't know what mechanism, I know that there's some, you know, some, you know how do, how do victims, or what scenarios, do they get the wages back? Do you have success in getting the wages back? Um, and it seems very cumbersome for somebody to try to participate in the, in the process. I wonder if you have any thoughts of ways that it could be, if there's a more expeditious way to try to get relief for these people. So our priority in uh, prosecuting wage theft cases, um, while one of the you know, awesome powers of being a prosecutor is the threat of incarceration. Um, we use that as a way to say, hey, you can go to jail or you can pay the wages. And it's amazing how quickly they pick pay the wages. Um, so for example, in the city metro case, we offer them just that. And lo and behold, uh, the two principals who were decrying poverty uh, for months and months and months, on the day that they pleaded guilty, came in with certified cashier's checks for almost $100,000. So that to us is a priority. We understand that it is a very big deal to be a victim um, and uh, to be uh, a cooperating victim in a criminal case. And so we prioritize that, and I know my, uh, my colleagues do as well, in, in recovering those wages. We frown upon payment plans without specific teeth. That's why we're all about enforcement. If, if we say, hey, you want a payment plan? That's fine, six months, a year, and then you go to jail. And it's amazing how quickly people find uh, the pennies to, to pay their workers back. Uh, to your point though, council member, um, that isn't always the most efficient way to get money back into the pocket of a person who didn't get paid last week. Um, obviously, in order for us to conduct investigations, that takes a period of time. In order for us to then prosecute the case, that takes a period of time. Um, and so what we're good at is on the large scale when we see big companies and when there's a lot, but for an individual worker coming to you and saying, you know, I didn't get paid last week, uh, there's not always an efficient mechanism for that to happen quickly. As soon as we're notified of it, we can start an investigation, but that takes us a period of time. And I, could I just add, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you have a worker complaining. I would love it if you would refer, uh, refer that to our counter, us, so you can do it to us and we can reach out to the Bronx counterpart. Or if they worked in Manhattan, it might be our case because what often happens is that worker might be your constituent, but you know, Councilwoman Rose will have five constituents and Councilwoman Wazel, and we will then make a great case. Um, we like to do three, uh, three or more workers because we like to kind of uh, immediately combat the sour grapes defense, right? Oh, this guy just was fired and he's mad. So if we have three or more workers, we'll take the case. Um, and that's cr across boroughs and across counties. Uh, <clears throat> I, I'm sure that that's, you know, it makes sense and I, and I think that you're trying to use the resources of your office efficiently. I will say it, it's, you know, it's very disturbing on occasion though. I'm, I'm sure this has happened to all of us. You know, you'll, you'll meet a woman, you know, a, a you know, mother with kids who got screwed out of, you know, 
two weeks of pay, you know, they told her they're going to pay her, they told her they're going to pay her, they didn't pay her, and she kept going to work, um, and, you know, and then really in a bad spot, and they don't really, you know, are they going to testify, are they going to, you know, they, they're not really in a position to do that. It's, it, but, it, it, you know, like I said, I think that we've all encountered that, and it is uh, very disturbing. I, I appreciate you taking your time. Thank you. Thank Alan, anything? So, so let's go back to um, where you get these cases from and, and what kind of collaboration you have with, uh, with advocacy organizations, uh, labor organizations. Could you talk about that generally and, and then maybe we can drill down, dr drill down on some specifics? Well, so uh, I keep referring back to the Carlos Moncayo case because that case, because Carlos was an undocumented worker, it actually really opened up um, a lot of channels uh, for us, non-traditional groups that uh, did not generally trust law enforcement started to come forward. So for example, we work with the consulates of Mexico, Colombia, Guatemala, uh, and of course Ecuador. They often get, the consulates are used by uh, immigrants uh, as places that they can go um, and make complaints. So we get referrals from them. Then we subsequently started the uh, partnership with the Department of Labor. So they take a look, they get, so like what uh, Councilman uh, Cohn just mentioned about a, a, a mother coming in, they will get those complaints and they will refer them to us. Again, we try to say three or more, but we take a look at those. So what's been happening is as we've been sort of getting more and more, and of course we have the NICOSHs, we have the Carpenters Union who will see things because their, their labor organizers are out, not with union companies necessarily, but non I mean, although it can be union companies, they will see with the non-union companies um, workers not getting paid and complaining. So we have a variety. What's amazing is just in less than three years, we've really cultivated a wide referral source. And that's actually why we ended up reaching out to our counterparts. I mean, I think it's always been surprising. Anyone not from New York assumes that the city of New York is this one sort of morass. And that we, you know, if something happens in Queens, it's one prosecutor. And we all know that we live here. We, every borough is very distinct and we have our county lines. And for so long, we have not been talking to each other and working together like we should. Um, I think this is the, the first step, certainly in construction, and I can say, and I know there are many other areas that our offices have worked, but I think this was a, an area ripe for collaboration, and I think we're bearing, you know, the success so far. Uh, and, uh, Chairman, we also receive complaints through um, not only our, pro uh, product, um, our proactive outreach, but also through a number of hotlines that we have into the office, including uh, one for um, immigrant affairs, um, including um, we, what we were seeing is we weren't getting the phone calls and the number of complaints, and so we looked to see what are, were better ways to get uh, our word out so that people would actually reach out to us. It turned out a certain segment of the construction industry would not reach out to us by picking up the phone, and that's when we created the WhatsApp account so that we gave people um, an alternative to just picking up a phone and calling because that might uh, cause certain agita by reaching directly out to law enforcement through the WhatsApp um, application. We're getting more messages from uh, more people who are reporting unsafe work conditions uh, at construction sites. So it, really it, it's been a way of sort of finding ways that we can uh, identify with the people that are uh, impacted and give them a safe place where they can reach out to us. Are there any particular organizations in Staten Island that you that you work with? We work with El Centro. Uh, they're they're pretty good in bringing us cases and helping us along with the communicating with the victims uh, with us and making them feel comfortable to to talk to us. Um, and the state comptroller has uh, referred us cases. Diane Florence has referred us <laughs> cases. Um, Department of Labor. So they really come from all over. You mentioned the, the Harco case, which was somewhat of a, of a watershed on the one hand. Um, I know that Harco was convicted, the entity. Yes. I recall that there were individuals who were charged. Yes. I mean, a lot of these cases, the, the, the crime, the defendant is, is the company. Right. Which is un, unusual to most people, and they wonder, well, how does a company go to jail? <laughs> because that's what they think is usually the end result of a, of a prosecution. So 
What happened to the individuals in the Harco case? How often are you charging individuals? And without turning this into a law school class, the short version of when, when do you choose to bring cases against individuals versus companies? So we always try to go as high as possible, is what I will say. Um, and uh, the very short answer is we convicted everyone we charged in the Harco uh, Sky case. So we convicted both companies and we convicted both individuals. Now, what we wanted to do, of course, was go as high as possible. We would have loved to have gone after the presidents and, and the owners of those companies. Um, again, not going into law school, but you have to prove knowledge um, of the events. And we could not do that because the events that happened happened in real time. There were some emails, but it was just not quite enough to connect the owners. Are there uh, circumstances where you bring cases against the company, the corporate entity, but not individuals? There are, yes. And that would be in certain situations. We have one that will be coming soon where we don't quite the, the, we don't have quite have enough on the highest level. We believe there are higher level people that would be involved. We can't prove it. The person we can prove it against is a lower level of su su uh, supervisor and that we don't think is appropriate to bear the brunt because we think there's more, um, more culpable people. So in that particular case, which will be public in a number of months, we are ultimately just bringing charges against the company. And unfortunately, under New York state law, not so much your jurisdiction, but if you can lobby your uh, assemblyman, the maximum penalty if you follow the Harco case is $10,000, and that is just unacceptable. We are pushing a bill in Albany, the Carlos Moncayo bill, which would uh, raise corporate penalties to a million dollars uh, starting, and that's something that needs to be done. When we go after companies now, we have to be creative. So for example, Sky Materials is a great example. We couldn't go after the owner uh, for the homicide, but we went after him for the B-level insurance fraud, which is, uh, which, which is a high-level felony, as well as the wage theft. So in that case, we were able to go after uh, the uh, other defendants as well in a different way. And how often is it that you interact with the private bar? I don't mean the advocacy or the labor unions, but there is <laughs> a, <the> time. <laughs> a vast private bar of lawyers who represent uh, individuals who've been discriminated against or cheated in the workplace. I used to do that work. Um, do, you, do you collaborate with them? Do they, hey, this one is a real terrible case. You, you guys should look at this criminally. Occasionally, I would say the actual private law firms sometimes are wary of us because if we recover the wages, that's not, then they don't get their fees. So sometimes there's some wariness, but sometimes we get great referrals. Um, so it just depends, I guess. Well, I, I want to thank you for coming in. Um, you know, there are hearings where we press the district attorney's offices to, to come, and there are others where we just invite you. And it um, is not going without uh, notice that you, uh, you came when we didn't have to twist your arm to be here. So thank you very much for, for your testimony today. Thank you. Thank you for thank having you. us. Thank you. Um, Next, we uh, would love to hear testimony from the Manhattan Borough President, uh, Gail Brewer. Thank you very much. I am Gail Brewer. I am the Manhattan Borough President. I want to thank Chair Lansman for holding a hearing on this really important issue of wage theft. And I'm here with Hallie Chu from my office. Um, this is an important issue that I was not as uh, up on until we had the construction task force. And when we had the construction task force, which as you know, led into some of the legislation that the city council passed uh, fairly recently, I learned uh, 
And I've also been at some of the hearings uh, brought together by folks who work as independent contractors. And again, you've passed legislation on these topics, but the stories are horrific. So it's really important to have this hearing. And now you know that the report released in uh, January 2010 by the National Employment Law Project, NELP, found that in our city alone, unscrupulous employers deprive workers over one billion of their rightful wages annually. You heard earlier from Diana Florence, who's an ADA in the Manhattan District Attorney, Cy Vance's office, and I want you to know she's a rock star. Um, she sat in on every single one of our construction task force meetings for a year, and she really made the difference in terms of information. So it's great that she's here today, and she and her office have broke this down further in terms of lost wages into 20 million in unpaid wages in New York City every single week. Among this figure are millions of dollars not paid to the city's construction workers, as I mentioned, particularly those who fall outside of union protection and those whose immigration status make them vulnerable targets to wage theft, as you know. These workers put in the hours and the labor while their pay is delayed, quote unquote. Afraid that they may not find another job, they continue to work for no pay even when it becomes clear that the promised wages will never materialize. We heard about this over and over again, as you have. Wage theft exists across all industries and jobs. Today I want to focus on wage theft of construction workers because this concerns an industry that we can do something about through proper oversight of regulations. We know through the DA's office and the Construction for our Task Force and Wage Theft Initiative, the wage theft and unsafe working conditions in the construction industry are tied. Companies cited for workplace safety violations are often the same companies engaging in wage theft. Companies falsify insurance and tax documents. They do not pay workers for the work they do and do not cure safety violations at their sites or even report incidences that do occur. For too many construction workers, far too many construction workers have died because of construction site conditions that should have been rectified. And we all know that in 2016, in response to all of these related deaths that could have been prevented if they were property, proper safety procedures, Councilmember Jamani Williams and I co-sponsored what is now Local Law 196 of 2017, thanks to the City Council, construction safety law exists. It requires all who are on construction sites to undergo 40 hours of OSHA training or complete 100 hours of safety training. The law prescribes penalties for violations and requires demonstrated cure before the violations can be rescinded. Beyond the monetary penalty, incurring a record of non-compliance with the law is a black mark on the developer that can impact the company's future projects. This law complements the recommendations made in the Manhattan DA's Construction Fraud Task Force to monitor OSHA training and to create an OSHA car database. In conjunction with OSHA training noncompliance, the task force also re recommended barring building permits for a period of five years for companies convicted of a felony related to worker safety. This barring of permit can very well be applied to companies that have been convicted of wage theft. Wage theft occurs in other industries as well. And all again, the city council has done something about this. The Freelanders Union estimates that there are 1.3 million freelancers in New York City and 53 million nationwide. I think that number is growing. The union also estimates that 77% of these workers who span the workforce from technology to fashion to design, they many have experienced wage theft at some point in their career. And I remember before you passed their bill that I'll talk about in a minute, sitting down with the freelancers union and the particular group of models were obviously not the top models, were not represented by somebody famous, they could not get their pay and it was like 10 of them testifying to sitting around in somebody's office describing the challenge. It was almost beyond me too in terms of their experience. After much advocacy on this issue, I am pleased that the City Council passed Local Law 140 of 2017, as you know. Spearheaded by Brad Lander, it requires companies who hire freelancers to execute written contracts that describe work to be performed, the rate, 
the method of payment, and when payment is due. It requires payment within a reasonable amount of time, and as we speak, the Department of Consumer Affairs is promulgating rules and an outreach program, and I think we'll all be monitoring what they do. So the 2010 report by NELP mentioned above details an array of worker violations, from minimum wage violations to those that use overtime and off-the-clock work to defraud workers. It is clear that there's much more to do to prevent worker abuse, particularly for workers who are undocumented or not represented by a union. But the practice of out-and-out out theft, such as what occurs when a construction worker completes work and does not get compensated at all, <coughs> should be an initial target. I really thank all the DAs for focusing on this illegal practice and the city council for taking this up today. And again, you'll hear a lot more than what I have to offer, but I can just say that uh, with my limited experience with a year of the construction task force and many meetings with industries that are freelance, even though we have laws on the books, it's gonna take a great deal to make sure that they're implemented because people are still scared to come forth. Thank you very, very much, Chairman. Well, thank you, Madam Borough President, and thank you for, uh, for coming in and, and offering that, that perspective. You know, us as elected officials, you're a former council member, now Borough President, council members here, um, you know, we are involved as, as, as advocates and, and trying to push the system with the levers that we have. Um, I wonder if you could maybe talk a little bit about your observations, um, as, as you know, and I, I've seen you at the rallies, and, I, and, I, and I've seen the work that you do, the efforts to um, combat wage theft in the car wash industry or the retail industry, the fast food industry. Um, do you think that the construction fraud task force might be a model for, for other industries? Yeah, I, I think what happens, and maybe it's just me, but the information that comes forward when you have stakeholders meeting for a period of time is very different than a one-off conference. Mm. And people we learn from workers who, actually from Staten Island, who are day workers, and some of their experiences that are, unless you're in the room with them and you are able to have the DA's office and people from agencies uh, there, I don't think they actually knew some of the forces that are um, against these workers. So the answer to your question is yes. And even when you have a bill, you still, I think, need the uh, constant attention because this is a group of people who are not going to ever come forward unless you do the outreach. The folks from Staten Island were particularly uh, strong in terms of their advocacy, but they still felt they couldn't get to many of the infractions that were taking place uh, in terms of the uh, wage theft. So, yeah, yeah, the answer is yes. This is a big city. We can't reach everybody. Yeah. And, and since a lot of the, the, the workers who are being cheated are, are uh, being, being cheated and exploited because they're perhaps vulnerable because of their immigration status or just their, their social status in, in the world that we live in, the DA's office, the district attorney, you know, can be a very scary place. Yes. Um, it's probably very helpful to... And, and the other issue we learned together. from the construction task force, which is uh, the finding people to be the on-site safety coordinator, which could translate to also making sure that people get paid in a correct manner and that they get paid. That particular job title is very hard to fill. So even those kinds of pieces of information without a task force or and constant observation, it's hard to know that that too is a problem. So yes, the answer to your question is you do need that um, attention. Okay. Anything? Hello, I just want to thank Member you Rose. for all the work that you've done in um, construction safety and um, just advocating for uh, the um, immigrant workers and the low wage workers. And the domestic workers, often, they're the other ones that. I, I want to. I want to thank you for your advocacy. <laughs> You've um, been head and shoulders, and and I know my community um, of uh, um, my undocumented workers really appreciate your efforts on on their behalf. I just want to thank you. Thank you very much. Th thank you very much. Thank you very much, much Council Member. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Our our next and final panel. Uh, our representatives from the New York City District Council of Carpenters, 
Make the Road New York and Legal Services NYC. So if you're testifying from those organizations, come on down. Good afternoon. If you could raise your right hand, we can swear you in and get started. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Terrific. Um, why don't we start from, from this end over, and if you could just introduce yourself and give your testimony. We're going we're gonna to put a clock up there for five minutes. You know, you want to hit the highlights. Can. Oh, sorry, am I not? <clears throat> when we can. <laughs> uh, when our resources allow. But of course, we know that many more members of our client population suffer wage theft than we're able to serve. Um, there's a lot of numbers being thrown around, um, but I think that the numbers that came out earlier of about a billion dollars a year annually seems about right. It's tremendous. Um, but also because we provide other legal services, we're also aware of the uh, long-term uh, ancillary and collateral consequences of wage theft for families, including not being able to pay rent, not being able to find affordable housing, and even really long-term consequences like not being able to collect uh, full Social Security because your wages haven't been reported properly over the years. Um, as the City Council understood when it passed intro 1253, uh, one underpaying job can lead to another as employers sort of compete with each other uh, in a race to the bottom for wages. So we're really delighted to hear about some of the great gains that have been made recently um, and would like to support robust public enforcement um, of our wage theft laws. We advocates rely heavily on the Department of Labor's civil enforcement and the AG's and DA's offices um, to engage in criminal enforcement um, and also to send a message to employers statewide that wage theft laws have to be followed. Um, that being said, of course, agencies uh, like nonprofits can only do as much as we have the resources to accomplish. Um, I presume, in fact, I'm positive that the volume of complaints the Department of Labor gets is just a drop in the bucket compared to the overall wage theft that's happening. But we've heard that there's some 7,000 complaints a year that they get that they have to investigate, which is an enormous volume of complaints to be fully investigated uh, that require substantial resources and a strong commitment from the state um, to full enforcement. Um, there's also, of course, I think people testified a little bit about earlier, but the problems of collecting on um, judgments that people have received. Um, when I was in private practice also, but also in the public field, you know, we see these kinds of behaviors all the time. You know, employers who don't pay their workers also hide their money and in various other ways and engage in financial shenanigans, um, closing their businesses only to reopen the next day under a new name, selling off assets into cash that they then hide in their basement, uh, you know, sending over their house to their mother-in-law, whatever it is to hide their assets from people. Um, and so it's important, I think, not only for sort of public and private partnerships to engage in investigations, but also full collections to ensure that people can actually get back the money that is stolen from them. Um, I think there's a few steps which, if taken, would help ensure that our clients get paid, um, including passage of the sweat bill, the Securing Wages Earned Against Theft Act, which would help, um, help both uh, advocates like myself, but also the Department of Labor to attach uh, assets early on before wage thieves are able to dissipate them into the wind. Um, and also allowing for wage uh, liens on property. Um, similarly, again, I think the Department of Labor really needs sufficient resources to be able to actually go after collections that, that, that they've um, uh, found to be owing. Um, 
But I do believe that fully resourced, our government agencies, um, along with advocates and organizers across the city and state, can really work to roll back the tide of wage theft and make sure that New York State is a place where wage theft from low wage workers is not tolerated. Thank you. Is that less than five minutes? <laughs> very good. You're setting, setting a very good example. <laughs> but please, kidding aside, don't feel rushed. I mean, we want to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth Spratzer. I'm an, a staff attorney on the Workplace Justice Team at Make the Road New York. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share this testimony today regarding wage theft in low wage industries and the critical importance of criminal investigations and prosecutions of the most egregious violations. Um, Make the Road New York is a nonprofit community based organization with over 22,000 low income members. Um, dedicated to building the power of Latino and working class communities across New York City through organizing, policy innovation, um, transformative education, and survival services, which include legal services. Our workplace justice team, legal team, represents hundreds of low wage workers each year, immigrant workers predominantly, to enforce their rights under labor and employment laws. Um, and really the vast majority of the cases that come into our office are wage theft. Um, Again, these numbers have already been cited, but just to cite that in New York City alone, um, the figure is nearly $1 billion per year stolen from low-wage workers. Um, it's rampant throughout the city. It's in construction, but um, we see it in restaurants and warehouses and delivery, domestic work, um, where despite very strong laws on the books, enforcement completely lags behind. Um, we see employers steal wages in many ways by not paying minimum wage, not paying overtime, making unlawful deductions from pay, um, claiming to remit taxes and not actually doing that, um, making workers work off the clock. Um, those are just some of the ways, ways that, they, that, that wages are stolen every day. Um, these employers also don't pay, most of them don't pay um, unemployment insurance or workers' compensation contributions. In addition, they typically fail to provide accurate wage statements or notices of pay to their employees, which is required under the New York labor law, and they maintain false business records in order to evade compliance. Um, in addition, retaliation is a huge issue and continues to be where employers retaliate against workers or threaten to retaliate against them if they stand up to enforce their rights. Particularly right now, immigrant workers are facing increased threats um, regarding their immigration status if they come forward to enforce their rights. Um, there's been a focus today on construction industry and I think that there's a reason for that. I mean, we see countless cases of construction workers come into our office who typically are not paid any wages at all for several weeks of work. I would say that's the most common in the, in the construction industry um, or that, that we see. Um, you know, it, it seems that for many construction companies in New York, part of their business model is to shortchange workers of their pay. Um, re just recently, a group of 10 construction workers came into our office to seek help. Um, you know, it's a familiar story. First, their employer began to delay payments or pay them less than they were owed, promising to pay them later. Then slowly, they just, they just flat out refused to pay them any wages at all for two weeks of work. Um, two weeks of work can mean the difference for a low wage worker between being able to pay their rent that month and support their family or not. And when you took together the claims of all of these workers, all of the weeks, the unlawful deductions, it came to thousands of dollars in wages that the employer had stolen. Um, our office has successfully referred cases to the Labor Frauds Unit at the Kings County DA's office for prosecution. Um, we are seeking to refer other particularly egregious cases to the Manhattan DA's Construction Task Force. Um, it's critical that employers across New York City see that the risk of stealing wages far outweighs the profits of the thousands of dollars that they make. Um, criminal sanctions against employers who steal sends a strong message of deterrence to all employers that wage theft is a crime and they will be held accountable. Further, at this critical moment when immigrant workers are increasingly under attack, we hope that the city continues and we heard today that there is a commitment to demonstrate or that there's a demonstrated commitment to protecting the, the rights of all workers regardless of their immigration status. 
Um, we commend the city for its commitment to tough enforcement against wage theft and low-wage industries, and we urge the city council to expand resources for criminal enforcement of New York's strong protections against wage theft. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. And carpenters? And I, I, um, I remember working closely with the carpenter. I was in the assembly when we passed the, um, uh, the Misclassification Act, which I was one of the co-sponsors of. Thank you. So I, I know how long and deep the carpenters have been working on this issue. Indeed. So go ahead, please. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Lankman and all of the council members present for allowing me to speak today. Uh, my name is Ruben Colon. To my right is uh, my colleague, James Macon. And we are organizers for the New York City District Council of Carpenters, a representative body comprised of nine individualized uh, locals and 25,000 members. The New York City District Council is gravely concerned about the wage theft occur occurring across the city. According to the New York State Department of Labor, during 2017, approximately 1.2 work uh, million workers, uh, $2 million was owed to nearly 400 workers in cases prosecuted by the state. Additionally, Manhattan District Attorney Cyrus R. Vance stated that New Yorkers lose $20 million in unpaid wages weekly. In construction, this problem continues to grow as the only entity required to register on the site is the general contractor. General contractors hire subcontractors who in turn hire subcontractors who, with little to no accountability. These subcontractors pay wages often in cash and without benefits because there is not a record of them working on the site. This, is not only, this not only cheats the worker out of his or her hard-earned wages and workers' compensation, but also costs the city and state additional loss of revenue through unpaid city, state, and federal taxes. This is not a union versus non-union issue alone. It is an, an actual legal issue. Construction in the, is, da, is a dangerous occupation, and construction in New York City uh, presents unique hazards to workers. Workers' compensation and benefits are crucial to providing for workers in cases of injury, According to the New York State law, to New York State law, every employer is required to obtain workers' compensation insurance. The employer's premium is based on the employee's job classification. In highly dangerous jobs such as construction, these premiums can be high, higher than in other occupations. This system is often abused by employers misclassifying their workers with classifications requiring lower premiums. When wage theft occurs, it throws the workers' comp system off or out of balance. Workers' comp is based on wages. This ultimately cost the city and state. In June 2013, a report by the Fiscal Policy Institute, the New York City construction industry in 2011 cost the city and state $500 million due to worker misclassification. These numbers only continue to, <clears throat> to grow as, uh, as the, the largest component of loss is unpaid workers' compensation premiums, personal income tax, withholding, unemployment insurance, and other business taxes. In, cases, in the cases where a worker is injured working for a subcontractor without a record, it is impossible to identify who is responsible for the liability. As organizers, we speak to workers on a daily basis. They do not deserve the, the exploitation that is rampant in the industry. Thank you for taking the time to consider uh, our testimony. And we're open to questions if you like. Thank you all very much. So I, I would like to, to start with, um, what is your relationship and how receptive are the different district attorney's offices in New York City to working with you and on, a, on an ongoing basis and having a relationship, as well as any isolated examples of where you've brought them a potential case and, and have they, they looked at those, uh, that potential case and, and the opportunity to work with you with enthusiasm or this is not a priority for us? I think you had mentioned you had, the carpenters had worked with? We, we, we are working currently uh, with the Manhattan District Attorney uh -huh. as well as with the Staten Island District uh -huh. Attorney. Have you done any work or reached out to, to the Brooklyn District Attorney, the Queens District Attorney? The yes, yeah, we, we also have been working with the, Brook, uh, with the Brooklyn District Attorney as well. We haven't brought him any cases just yet, uh -huh. uh, but we are working on some cases, uh, most of which are pending, and we are unable to really discuss in detail, but. Uh, Maybe Jimmy can answer uh, uh, your question a little more thoroughly. Uh, I like to think that we are getting uh, the cooperation we need from the district attorney's office, Jim. Sure, I have to say. Um, Just bring the, the mic closer, thank with you. With the construction task force, uh, I've been able to contact, we have, actually have a contact person held in Cologne, which I present cases that I think have a good chance of being prosecuted. 
and she takes a look at that. She takes a look at all the cases, and she'll pass them on to whoever needs to be passed on to. And uh, they don't take into account any factors other than if a crime has been committed or if it's something that they think they can prosecute. So uh, this goes a long way with us, with a lot of undocumented workers who are afraid to come forward. They don't have to have that fear. I mean, recently with the Staten Island DA, you know, several of those workers had questionable documentation and it was never an issue. So they, they got justice and that's, that goes a long way. Mm -hmm. And make the road and legal services. I, I know you mentioned Manhattan. I think you might have mentioned Staten Island or Brooklyn. How about Queens, the Bronx? I haven't personally, but I think that you... Yeah, our office has ref referred a few cases successfully to the Brooklyn DA and are currently working to refer to the Manhattan. Um, we haven't so far with the Queens or Bronx DA. Mm -hmm. Some of it might be uh, um, perceptions about what kinds of cases they take. So our understanding was that they were taking basically construction cases, which we don't get a lot of at legal services as many, but also like large damages cases, like the numbers we were talking about before. Uh, and most of our clients are, you know, they're missing five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars in wages, which is for them, you know, like a year's worth of work. But for the Manhattan DA, I don't know, or the Queens DA, or whatever, I'm not sure if, if mm -hmm. it rises to the level. So it could be that we just need to communicate better about what to do with low damages cases. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything more that you think the city council can be doing to, um, I don't want to say encourage prosecutions because that's that's not what prosecutors are, are there for. We don't want to overuse the criminal justice system. That's part of the ethos of this council. But um, is there anything that we could do to, let's say, just to foster collaboration and, and, and raise awareness among the district attorney's offices that this is an aspect of the law that they have an obligation to enforce just as much as someone knocking someone else over the head, you know, and grabbing their, their, their wallet in the street? If, if I might. Yeah. Uh, I, I dare say that the, the district attorney's office reached out to us. Uh, they were aggressive in, in doing so, and, and we appreciate that. Uh, I think uh, enforcement is where the key uh, may lie. Uh, it's one thing to get you know, uh, the, the, the money back to the workers in, in, in the right hands where, where it rightfully belongs. Uh, it's another thing to, uh, to enforce uh, with the little teeth, uh, uh, maybe uh, 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 denying a permit to somebody with a conviction for five years, maybe that's not a bad thing. I think that uh, uh, it's right now it's a matter of doing business for them, you know. Uh, you got caught, you pay, your, pay the money you owe, you might get a little, uh, uh, a little fine, uh, but I, I don't know that they see any real repercussions. Uh, I see this every day, day to day. I talk to these workers and it's, it's like one of the council members said that uh, uh, you'll get the individual worker who may come in and there's not a lot you could do with one person. You need to be able to corroborate the story, and, and, and it, it gets difficult. So three to more or more workers coming forward, by by all means, refer them to the carpenters union. Mm -hmm. we, we will take action. I, I think also maybe if there was a little bit more communication about how to get U visa certification for undocumented workers who are reporting these kinds of crimes, I think would help to help people want to talk to the DA's offices more. Like not, not looking into their papers is important and then also potentially for design and um, for So, uh, this is probably my last question. What kind of resistance and reluctance do you get from the workers on whose behalf you're trying to, 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 to move these cases, whether it's in the construction industry or fast food industry, whatever it is, um, because of their, their, their immigration status and are different DA's offices uh, more or, or less uh, um, welcoming or um, uh, have workers with immigration issues have more confidence that if they go to this DA's office, they're going to be taken seriously and protected? Well, I think that's really the benefit of like community-based organizations kind of having first contact with these workers is um, in almost every intake I do, the question does come up about do I have rights as an undocumented worker? Can this expose my status? And having like culturally competent legal services providers to really discuss all of these things and to talk through like any fears and risks and to be clear that like their status should not be relevant in, in a criminal prosecution I think goes a long way. And then often once we do that, most workers that we see at least, and especially they've come through organizers that make the road so they sort of have like also a 
little bit of a consciousness of that this is their right to come forward. Um, I think with all of that, most have been willing to do so, but certainly since um, November, like that has, the fear has increased. Um, I've personally taken workers to the Department of Labor on Varick Street, to the Consumer Affairs, and I literally have to hold their hands because they're afraid. Um, when I get to the agency, the agencies are more than receptive. They always have an interpreter and they always take the case. So it, it's a matter of, of the workers overcoming that fear. And I think that the businesses instill that fear. So I think maybe education on some part could help to let them know that the laws apply to you regardless of status. And I think the DA has gone a long way. He had a conference earlier uh, this year saying that he would you know, prosecute the crime. So uh, it's, it's a matter of, of getting the education out there. Council Member Rose. Um, um, you would say that most of these cases are um, predicated against immigrants, right? Um, but is there some sort of percentage, you know, um, that you could say um, immigrant versus, you know, um, citizen uh, person who is a non, who has non-immigrant status? Is there like a number? Is it diminutive? We could probably try to ex extrapolate between legal services and make the road because legal services, is, we're not allowed to represent undocumented immigrants who aren't, who don't qualify for at least some form of immigration relief. So we can't represent purely undocumented immigrants, whereas make the road can. And so I think that you'll see that make the road gets substantial. I mean, we have a lot of wage theft complaints. I mean, mm -hmm. thousands a year, but I think make the road has more per capita than, than we do, which I think would indicate it's way more prevalent, I think, in the immigrant community. Okay, you, yeah, no, no idea of like Well, percentage. in construction, uh, we, we see, I, I don't have a, an exact number, but I dare say 80% of what comes to us are from uh, people who are, have questionable documentation, if you will. Okay. Uh, yeah, and we, we, we don't shy away from that. Uh, we, we, we believe, you know, there is a, a human aspect to, to, to the issue, and, and uh, we will pursue as best we can. Yep. And I thought, um, to your point about um, the loss in terms of taxes and uh, workman's comp and things of that nature, um, when these cases are, are tried, is there ever the step further to go to try to um, recoup the, um, the losses in terms of, of taxes and, and things on the part of the cities, the city? Well, I, I think what it is is that different agencies handle different aspects. Um, you know, federal taxes would be, you know, a government, a federal government thing. So, and, I mean, it's not only a crime against, you know, the individual, but it also defrauds, you know, um, the city government, state, you know, fed, federal government. And so I was just wondering, if you know these cases are looked at in in their totality, or or just only as not only, but you know primarily individual cases, the what, what I think is happening is uh, now with the district attorneys that they're taking a, a look at it, that they're processing the uh, information we give them, and giving it to each individual agency that can do the best job with it, that can prosecute it, but it's very time consuming. It's, you know, when you start crossing agencies, it becomes very, labor, you know, a big task. So, you know, it's, it's, there's cases out there, they're being, they're being looked at and prosecuted, but it's, it's not an instant fix. It's, it's something that takes time. I, I, yeah, I we, we, I'm oh. sorry. Okay, well, we've seen that the Department of Labor, where we've referred cases and maybe flagged an issue of unlawful deductions or something, that they then have gone in and investigated. I think they have maybe their own unit or individuals who look into whether the, that employer is paying workers' comp and unemployment insurance. Yeah, I mean, if we're talking about a billion dollars in, you know, um, in terms of the loss to workers, you know, I was just wondering if there was any follow-up to the loss in 
taxes. I know that the IRS accepts what are essentially whistleblower claims about basically wage theft uh, as a tax fraud issue. I think that it's a very small unit, if it's even a full unit, um, but I think that that would be a great idea, for example, in other fields too, to have a, a, a mechanism by which to complain about not just the wage theft, but the tax issues and the social security issues. I mean, because I think employers who, um, who are, are taken to task and have to reimburse the workers for whatever that amount of money is, I think um, the tax implications have, you know, larger ramifications and they might be less, you know, um, encouraged to, to keep, you know, workers' wages if they knew that there were larger tax, you know, implications. Thank you. It, it, indeed, the, 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 there is the, the construction uh, task force itself. Uh, there are various agencies that are involved with that task force, and I'm sure uh, uh, by, the, by the very fact that they're at the same table that they will step in if and when, I guess, it, it would involve their jurisdiction, if you will. I know that uh, we've, we've been involved in other cases in the past uh, where the owner actually went to jail for a, a year and I think it was six months for tax evasion. Uh, which wasn't the focus of the case, but somehow it was picked up on uh, by other sta uh, state agencies, city agencies. So, uh, uh, yeah, but I, I, I do see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I think your testimony just really highlights the importance of, of the collaboration with labor organizations, advocacy organizations, non-criminal legal services uh, providers. And I use the um, example of, of one person knocking another on, over the head in the street and stealing their wallet. A 911 call is gonna be made, the cops are gonna show up and the machinery is gonna, gonna start moving. Mm -hmm. Someone getting cheated out of their wages doesn't have that same kind of, same kind of machinery, same kind of structure. Um, and given that so many of the workers who are being exploited and, and cheated and stolen from uh, are, uh, uh, have shaky immigration status uh, issues or just kind of disenfranchised unrepresented people in our society. Uh, it, it, we're not gonna be able to, 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 to bring the criminal justice system to bear in these cases in an appropriate calibrated way um, without collaboration with, with organizations such as yours. So, you know, as this moves forward, please consider uh, uh, me, and I wanna speak for the councilwoman, but I'm, I'm sure anything that relates to Staten Island uh, as, as allies and, and making any connections that need to be made with DA's offices or, or making sure that these issues get the priority that they, uh, that they deserve. With that, thank you very much for your testimony. That concludes our hearing.